guys. Welcome uh, to the Run Pure Sports College Basketball Preview Show, Part One. Uh, it's Wednesday, October twenty seventh. Um, we're gonna do two Wednesdays. We're gonna do another one um, on the Pac twelve, the SEC, and the Big Twelve. But tonight, we're gonna talk a little bit about uh, some of the national storylines, uh, and then preview the ACC, the Big East, and the Big Ten. Um, I'm here with, uh, two special guests. Um, we've got my good friend, Gavin, uh, who some of you know, from the run pure bet side, you know, he prefers to operate a bit in the shadows, uh, often joins kegs, live betting shows. Um, you know, he's a sick bastard, usually bets, uh, MMA and college basketball, obviously is known to bet some, you know, hairy low and mid-major games, uh, which I know John does as well. How are you, Gavin? Doing well, man. Yeah, it's uh, it's good to connect with some people here and, and finally start talking some hoops. It's been uh, a lot of MMA, you know, that I, I don't mind. And, you know, with college football in full swing, things are starting out well. But this is certainly the uh, the passion sport of mine, you know, the one that I've been following most closely and feel that, you know, we got a pretty good informational edge on the field. So happy to uh, share some knowledge and shoot, see where we all uh, shake out on some of these takes. Yeah. And then I'm also joined by John Fendler, who we're super excited to have on. Uh, Gavin and I. John, I've been kind of following you on Twitter for a bit now. Uh, you seem to also be one to roll in the mud a bit, you know, some low and mid-major stuff. You know, I see you betting D2 football. Uh, what's going on? No, I'm pumped. You guys are having me on. I, I appreciate it. I started back in college, you know, 10, 11 years ago watching. And back then there was no ESPN3. So I'm watching these shady-ass internet streams, some guy with a flip phone filming in Idaho. And that kind of became my thing. And back then it was a little easier. Now with Ken Palm, there's very few mistake lines. But nonetheless, that's where I think the edge mostly is. Awesome. Um, so I think the first thing that we should talk about, you know, it'll kind of get us into the uh, college basketball mood, is I want to talk about what we think some of the national storylines are. Um, you know, as you've been talking about on, on Twitter a lot, John, you know, we're ready for the games and, you know, we're tired of the coach speak and stuff like that. Uh, so I'll go to Gavin first. I'm sure he has a good one uh, for what he thinks the top storyline is this season. I think it's, it's gotta be one undoubted, you know, number one storyline for the off season has just been the wild, wild West nature of the transfer portal and, you know, with almost the kind of quasi creation of, you know, what on paper looks to be, uh, you know, almost like a super team in a sense. Uh, you know, last year we had some some really good transfers. Andrew Nemhard, Johnny Juzang, Mac McClung, Carly Jones, James Akinjo, uh, DJ Carton. But I mean, this year you're talking about, you know, program rewriting folks changing schools from big mid majors to another with Remy Martin, with Marcus Carr, Trey Mitchell, Quincy Gary, Marion Jackson. I mean, yeah, Mary Jackson, mid-major to big school, but I think it has to be the number one story in terms of just the entire offseason, getting all these alerts from, from Rothstein and these folks who just another huge name into the transfer portal and going to play for a serious contender. And I think it creates for some real interesting kind of, uh, you know, first tier of teams. There's probably 10 to 12 teams that are, I think are super live to win it all just on paper with what they got here. Yeah, and I know that you had to throw in Mary and Jackson there. That's your boy. Um, I had to. <laughs> yeah, I I think that that's a huge one, obviously. And I think, you know, when we talk later about teams are higher on and lower on, you'll see that, you know, I'm not a big fan of the let's let's roll the ball back out with the same group of guys from last year. You know, if they weren't that great. Um, what do you think, John? Yeah, I think it's it's kind of related to Gavin's point, but in some ways the corollary to it in that you have these all of these mid-major schools who bring back a bunch of grown-ass dudes. I mean, 22, 23-year-old guys who've been playing together for a while. And for years, I think those of us who are fans of mid-major basketball have kind of lamented the picking off by the, the big, the Power 5 programs, but that goes both ways. And a lot of these mid-majors have scooped up some really legit down transfers who, it's not that they're necessarily out of place, but they can come in from day one and kind of dominate the league. And I think you're going to see some of these teams, uh, you know, in the kind of solid mid-major leagues, the Sun Belt, CUSA, the Horizon, those teams, if they get the right ones into the field, I mean, they're going to be a big, big problem uh, in the first round. Yeah. I know Gavin loves that. You know, I'm sure he'll be picking your brain about those later on. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, so kind of dovetailing off of that, 
uh, my number one story, I think is Texas, you know, uh, just how they are able to mesh, um, how Beard is able to do this. I mean, you know, in case you haven't been paying attention, they bring in Marcus Carr, Timmy Allen, Dylan DeSue, Trey Mitchell, Christian Bishop, Devin Askew. I mean, you'll be hard pressed to find a team that's added more talent, you know, maybe ever. Um, and then obviously adding Chris Beard is, you know, maybe just as massive. Um, but I think the big thing for me and Johnny you probably help with this. What do you think uh, adding Chris Beard does to like the style of hoops they're going to play? Cause they have a bunch of studs uh, and obviously at Texas tech, you know, uh, he ran um, defense first um, just with like basically one playmaking guard. Uh, so what do you think about Texas coming in? I'm not too concerned about the defensive buy-in because most of these guys come with reputations, at least decent defenders, other than Disu, who's, I guess, okay. But I'm a little concerned about the offense because you have a bunch of high usage, usage guys in the 25 28% range. You put them on one floor, and Beard's offenses have never been known for spacing. It's a very motion-heavy offense. So Marcus Carr is like the definition of the, the pick-and-roll guard creating off the bounce. I don't think he really gets to do a ton of that. So I, I could I could see ways that this goes sideways, not just the chemistry and the cohesion, but just from a scheme perspective, it, this is no lock. Yeah, and, you know, as Gavin knows, they're, they're at Gonzaga that first Saturday of the season. So um, what do you think about Texas, Gav? Yeah, I'm curious to see what Beard does defensively. You know, at, at Tech, they ran that, uh, that kind of pack line, no middle defense, but – uh, you know, Mark Adams, I think, was really a little bit more of the kind of architect of that whole thing. And, uh, you know, him, him taking over at Tech and Beard leaving him behind, uh, it'll, it will be curious because uh, they have – the thing is they do have super versatile front court pieces in terms of guys like DeSue and Bishop who can guard, you yeah, know, Bishop two through for five sure. and, and have the foot speed to move in the pick and roll against, you know, other teams in the conference, and so to speak. So uh, – I you know, I, I, like John, I could see how it goes sideways. There's a lot of mouths to feed and, it, you know, ego could surely come into it with some of these guys trying to, trying to get theirs. But, you know, I, I tend to believe in Chris Beard and trying to keep everybody kind of, you know, at bay checked in and, and bought in, you know, to, to the scheme and what they want to run. And, you know, I, like I said, I, I don't know if this is a team that we look to hammer early on betting. I think it takes a little bit to kind of get their footing, but I think once Beard gets a feel for, how they want to shake out this rotation and the way they want to roll it out. I think this team potentially becomes, you know, in the conference play a little bit undervalued uh, and, and one that we could start looking towards, you know, midway through the year to bet on. Yeah, Steve, I don't know if you mentioned the Trey Mitchell also from UMass. I mean, he's like the back to the basket, traditional five man, a great rebounder and a really talented low post scorer, but I, I don't know how he really fits in the scheme, especially with Bishop who used, who's used to being small ball five at Creighton. Yeah, I mean, I mean in lineup combos, but it's going to take a while. Yeah, I think Bishop's a perfect fit there. He, uh, we were huge fans of him last year. Um, what about you, John? Uh, what did you have written down for this? <clears throat> Typically for, for Texas? No, no, just like uh, national storylines, uh, stuff to watch entering the season. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm curious about a couple, and I think you kind of hit on it. You know, I mentioned just now the mid-major teams to bring a lot of guys back, but I, the the power five teams who are running, as you said, running it back with the same roster. I know we're going to cover the ACC more in depth, but Notre Dame to me is a great example. It floored me when I went through Ken Palm two weeks ago when he put his numbers up and he had them 27th. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I texted Gavin about that too. <laughs> it almost seemed like a, an algorithm glitch. Yeah. It did not make any sense, given that maybe is, they learned to play defense this off season. Yeah, right. <laughs> There's talk that they brought in a you know, former assistant who's supposed to be revamping the defense. Yeah, uh, Anthony Ooh. Solomon, I think, came comes back from Dayton. Right. Yeah. And they pretty much only lose uh, Juwan Durham, but yeah, we'll get there all in time. Yeah. yeah. These types of teams in Wisconsin last year was that team that they got really hot at the end of the COVID shortened season, and they come in. I think everyone had them top 10 last year to start the year, but we, we saw their ceiling the previous year and they just never got any better. Partially because a lot of these guys were 22, 23 years old. Yeah. And because uh, Greg Gard is playing Michael Potter 20 minutes a game, but uh, that was last year. <laughs> uh, the second thing I had written down um, 
you know, the, the biggest thing that, that I think got the most ink last year was the blue buds kind of all underperforming kind of all at once, which I thought was great. Uh, just personally, uh, you know, I'm more of a new blood guy than a blue blood guy, I guess you could say. Um, so we don't really have to go into much discussion on that here, but I just think it'll be super interesting to see how those teams bounce back. You know, the Kentuckys, the Dukes to a lesser extent, like, UNC and Michigan state too. Um, I'm on opposite sides on a couple of those teams. So, uh, and then lastly, I just wanted to get your guys thoughts on um, the, just not the big 10 in depth, but just the storyline that it's been over 20 years since we've seen a big 10 national champion. Um, Ken Palm's got four big 10 teams in his top eight, um, which I know you've seen, John. Um, do you think any of them, can do it this year? My kind of macro opinion on the Big Ten, and not when they play each other, but when they get out of conference and when they get into the later rounds of the tournament, is so many of these teams play through a high usage, big guy, Purdue, Illinois, Michigan. I think it's hard to win that way deep in the tournament. And, and there's a small sample size risk here, but the last couple of Final Fours, you have all these teams that are very guard-driven with bigs who are lower usage. You kind of know their roles. Like Baylor's the great example, of course. Mm -hmm. Garbage man, big and then the, the dominant guards, but all these big 10 teams, like we saw Illinois against Loyola, how easy it was to take Kofi out of the game. Same with Purdue, with North Texas, they took Travion right out of the game. If you have a high usage big in the 30, 33% range, that can cause some problems against a really good defensive coach. Yeah. Gavin, what do you think? I know you, you're a little bit down on the big 10 overall. Yeah. I, I don't want to say that I, I feel like they beat each other up. It's kind of, it's kind of cliche, but I was looking at it from the, I was looking at the same thing from the opposite perspective of John and that guard play pays, you know, late in the year. And you, you look at a lot of teams and, you know, big men centric and they're probably going to pay the bills, you know, throughout the regular season in terms of who wins these big man matchups, you, you know, got to include Hunter Dickinson and obviously Trace Jackson Davis. And it, it, it's a, it's a gluttony of big men. But if you really don't have any kind of guard centric guys, you know, late shot clock go to scores that can get you a bucket, it, it, especially when you get into sticky games, you know, in March, it, it gets pretty hairy. So I, I'm kind of I'm kind of on the same bandwidth as, as John, but just from the opposite end in terms of lack of guard play. Yeah. And I think the best example of that coming into the year is a team like Ohio State, who who they're going to start like Jamari Wheeler at point guard. You know, is he really going to win you a final four game? Um yeah, so uh, Gavin, did you have anything else under this topic, you know, the national storylines? No, let's uh, let's jump into these uh, conferences. All right, let's do that. <clears throat> so ACC, uh, I'll just I'm going to start by reading out just the the um, media projected standings, and then we can just kind of go into it. So they've got it: Duke, Florida State, North Carolina, Virginia, Virginia Tech in the top five. And then Louisville, Syracuse, Notre Dame, NC State, Georgia Tech, Clemson, Miami, Wake Forest, Pitt, and Boston College. Um, Gavin, so who are you higher on than the field in the ACC? You know, and part of it has to do with what we just saw last year, but it has to be Miami for me, as, as tough as that is huh. to say. Um, they, they actually probably, if you, you know, if I know it's more, uh, backcourt talking about, you know, point guard and shooting guard, but if you talk about kind of the one through three spots, I mean, you look at Charlie Moore, Isaiah Wong, and, you know, if we get a, ha a healthy Cam Augusti, I mean, that can be a super usable, uh, backcourt and cause some teams matchup problems with more, um, having pretty good, you know, speed off the dribble and can create, you know, shots for himself or set up you know, Wong and, and um, Augusti has late shot clock scores. Now, obviously, uh, the the front court leaves plenty to be desired. Uh, personally, I'm a little bit higher on Rodney Miller than some. You know, he's got, I think he's got some good upside and quick twitch athleticism to, to kind of be a versatile big. And Sam Wardenberg and, and Dan Gawker are all, you know, both coming back from, from serious injuries. So, I, I you know, maybe Jim Laranaga is losing a little bit of the locker room, but um, it, it was just so depleted. It had to be one of the most depleted teams yeah. from uh, injuries in COVID last year that I think they just come in a little bit undervalued. And look, I mean, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to start scrimmage over reaction season. We saw Wong just go, you know, completely nuts against that 
D2, but I mean, you got three guys that can legitimately score in that backcourt. I, I think there's a little bit of upside if, if they can learn how to, you know, play together and not uh, have too many cooks in the kitchen, so to speak. Yeah. Blair Nag is still kind of in my eyes, surprisingly recruiting pretty well too um, for his age. Um, I am not a Charlie Moore guy <laughs> personally. Um, what do you think about Miami, John? It's kind of surprising given Larry Nagy's <laughs> reputation back from the Mason days and even, you know, for the first couple of years of his Miami tenure, but they've finished outside the top hundred in defensive efficiency three straight years. And part of that is this pretty unprecedented run of injury luck. And they had, I think, a pretty average amount of COVID problems last year, but the Chris Likes debacle where he was yeah. every questionable and he was never going to play that kind of shit that's gone on now for a couple of years. But I think there's, I agree with Gavin that, there's clearly upside. I, I the floor is a little shaky, but if, if you're looking for that kind of flyer that could in, get into that middle-ish tier, push towards you know five six range, I could buy that if it all comes together. They're going to score. I just wonder about the defense. Yeah. All right. So who are you higher on than the field then, John? It took me a while to come around, but the more I've looked at UNC, the more I start getting this feeling that you know it's not necessarily Jawan Howard 2.0, but I mean, Hubert Davis's path is kind of similar, and it's a, in a similar story where you have the new coach coming in who's going to start running NBA style modern offense. And he, you know, Roy Williams the last two years put up the two worst, two of the three worst offensive seasons in his entire UNC tenure. Mm-hmm. And it was because the spacing was so bad. I mean, one of the worst spacing teams in the country never figured out how to play without two bigs. So they're going to guard. I'm kind of impressed with the defensive pieces and then adding two stretch four type shooters with Garcia and Manic and Garcia could be more than just a shooter. He could end up being a really well-rounded uh, four man. So they're going to open the season. I think Ken Palm has him 40. I'm not saying that's wrong per se, but there's a clear ceiling there. That's like somewhere in the 10 to 15 range. Yeah. I think that's, that's true too. Uh, that's, that's not who I have, but that was my, my second choice probably. Um, I just think that Baycott is going to have a monster season. You know, he finally gets some room to, to, to operate. He's not looking over his shoulder after every possession to see if he's coming out. I mean, um, you know, just on, on, on the DFS side, right, Gavin, he was 1.13 fantasy points per minute last season. Crazy efficiency when he was staying out of foul trouble and staying in the rotation. Playing 22.7 a game, you know. So, John, just to give you some context. so. Average is probably 0.75. Elite is 0.85 plus. There's probably eight to 10 guys in the country who are over 1.1. Um, so, you know, I do like kind of adding that in because you you can see guys who maybe didn't get a ton of minutes, but see that they're productive when, when they're on the court. And mm-hmm. that's a big thing in early season DFS is kind of identifying guys who we think their role might increase um, while sustaining a lot of that uh, per minute efficiency, I guess you could say. But yeah, I mean, I'm 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 on the same page with UNC. I hate to say it, um, God, they whooped our ass in the ACC tournament last year. That sucked. But um, yeah, I just man, Caleb Love is so so bad last year. You can he to... be as bad as he was last year? No, he, it's he impossible. cannot possibly right. No, um, I he think. Does... Like Baycott, he'll have a lot more room, too, because last year he was driving into a packed paint because the bigs were just hanging out under the rim. I know. Uh, I yeah, do Manic, think – Manic is a good compliment. Dawson Garcia is the stone nut yeah, compliment yeah, yeah. He's in terms nut. of being Manic plus having a little bit more um, quick twitch, being a little more uh, foot speed, a little more ball handling capability. Might not be the shooter, you know, from, from range, but I think you cannot have found a better match for Baycott in terms of – you know, losing losing Walker Kessler, losing De'Aaron Sharp, losing Garrison Brooks, and Baycott's going to step up. I, like you said, I think into a, into a monster role this year. Yeah, same. Um, and and they kind of found something with Kerwin Walton last year. I I thought he was all right. Um, so the team I have written down is NC State. Um, I kind of like this team. I'm I'm not sure, Gavin, if this is just the uh, excitement from not having to play power forward roulette on DraftKings with Thunder Burke and Manny Bates and, you know, who's, who's going to foul out in 14 minutes and who's going to, you know, break the slate. But uh, man, I, I am a huge fan of Cam Hayes. I thought that coming down the stretch last year, he looked really good. Um, 
we talked a little bit about Devin Askew earlier. He he kind of had the opposite trajectory as the season went on. You know, Askew gets benched, uh, wasn't really ready as a freshman uh, point guard, but I thought Cam Hayes really, really played well um, going to the end of the season there. Um, and then Gavin knows I'm a big Helms guy. You know, when uh, Devon Daniels went down, everyone thought that they were just kind of tank the season, but uh, Helms showed that he can kind of carry a team. And I expect him to be like a 15 or so point a game guy. Um, and then they bring in Morsell from Virginia, who I thought was kind of an odd fit there anyways. Uh, and, he, you know, he's, he's said to the media throughout the off season, you know, he's been talking about how excited he is to kind of leave that Virginia offense and get to play out and transition. I mean, he, he was a top 50 recruit last season. Um, so I think that, I like NC State's, at least they're starting five. And I think that, you know, they're a team, you know, they're picked kind of right near Notre Dame and Clemson and Syracuse. I think that they're going to be better than all three of those teams. Um, Gavin, what do you think? I, I guess I'm, I don't know. I, I'm just super worried. You know, they, they definitely played feistier than we thought they were going to surely after the Devon Daniels injury. I think Cam Hayes is solid, you know, in terms of, kind of ceiling and can can he kind of carry a team he's going to be looked at you know in terms of being the the go-to ball handler um you know i think there's i think there's upside but i think it's a relatively maybe relatively higher floors and and lower ceiling i don't know i'm not i'm not super big on them but maybe they maybe they come and surprise me i don't know i don't have a, a super strong take on them on or either way honestly yeah i'm not saying that they're gonna be a, a top three or four team in the acc i just don't think they're the you know 10th um john what do you think yeah, and Gavin kind of beat me too. It's like I could, I could be swayed either way. I just I think they have a very narrow range of outcomes. Like you know, kind of what they are, and there's going to be certain games, like you just know that they're going to play Duke at home, and they're going to probably play their best game against Duke, that kind of thing. And then they'll have a they'll you know lay a turret at Pitt or at Wake or something. They're just so erratic. And I my big concern with them, as it has been for the last couple of years, is that Keats's style was great in the CAA, but against superior or equal athletes in the ACC, pressing all the time isn't that effective, especially if you don't have a lot of depth. So but they're not going to be a deep team this year by any means. Not at all. Yep. I buy all those things. All right, uh, Gavin. So we did our high on. Who are you low on in the ACC? Uh, this, has, this has not been a, uh, a profitable business. Uh, the last couple of years, but I think I have to say Florida state in all honesty. Oh no. Um, <laughs> I, 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 yeah, you know, and, and yeah, bet against Leonard Hamilton, you know, to your own demise. And I, I could be ending up with egg on the face for this one, but I think it's really hard to overstate the, the defensive versatility that they lost with Balsa with Raekwon gray and with Scotty Barnes. I think those, those three pieces were, such unique assets to have, you know, in a very obviously athletic, uh, heavy ACC. Um, you know, part of me worries about, you know, is, does Caleb Mills have the hero, you know, capability to do it for these guys? And, and even if he does, will Leonard play him more than 24 minutes? Because he doesn't like playing nobody 30 minutes. Um, you know, polite, solid, good two-way player old glue dude, you know, Malik Osborne is kind of, you know, what he is. He's super uninspiring. They get Cameron Mitchell, who is a complete wild card, you know, coming from Kentucky. Um, but, you know, I, I have heard some good things about these two incoming freshmen in terms of Jalen Worley and, and Matt Cleveland, especially this Matt Cleveland kid. Uh, I think he comes from, you know, LeBron's high school, which doesn't mean uh, shit for how good of a basketball player he is, but he's at least on the map. He's re uh, real solid. So, I don't know. There's a lot of uncertainty with Florida State for a team that is just, you know, slotted into the top 25, I think somewhat due to, you know, last season's performance and obviously, quote unquote, winning the ACC in the uh, shortened year. Yeah. Um, you left off MJ Walker, too, who I thought, you know, has just been a steady guy for them the last couple of years. Um, yeah, the Cameron Fletcher thing is just one of the funniest things I've ever heard. He was pissed that he didn't play that many minutes at Kentucky. So he goes and joins Florida state, you know, where <laughs> Leonard's going to play 10, 12 guys a night. You know, I'm sure he, uh, I'm sure he did a ton of research before he transferred there. 
Um, John, what do you think about Florida State this year? I get the issues, but I'm at the point now, and I used to be kind of a Leonard Hamilton hater for whatever reason. I thought his teams did strange things. I thought they played too much ISO ball, but I've kind of bought in the last couple of years. I'm starting to think now that he's really in the same way that Kelvin Sampson has. The program is starting to just sort of recruit itself. Uh, and he's, he's so good. His staff is so good at identifying scheme fits. You, you just know at some point it's going to be like the fourth or fifth game of the year. They're going to be playing someone good. And they're going to pull some guy off the bench who you've like barely heard of. And that dude is just going to dominate the game. He just seems to be able to find these hidden gems. So, no, I'm not saying it, it's clearly not as good as the last couple of years. But it would not surprise me if they rip off like eight, nine in a row in the middle of league play and finish, you know, 14 and four or something. It's just that kind of team. Yeah, I think there's something to be said about just the amount of length that they always have. And, you know, that can just overwhelm team. You know, I, I've you know, I went to Virginia Tech, so I'm a tech fan. And when we played them, you know, you just you just can't move the ball on offense. You know, they're they're so long. Um and, you know, I saw that they brought in two more seven footers, you know, he just rotates these guys in, you know, they play 12 to 18 minutes. Um, you know, they're <laughs> Gavin for a DFS side. They're almost always a cross off team just because no one plays enough minutes to really be viable. And they never um, play in a high scoring game because of their defense. Yeah. So, um, John, who do you have as your, uh, low on team in, in the ACC? I promise I'm not trying to ingratiate myself to the Virginia Tech fan, but I am shockingly down on Virginia. Hell yeah. I am too. Let's go. (laughs) For different reasons. But I've been the biggest Tony Bennett fan. Like I've I've bet them so much over the years and it's just not there. And it's not him, obviously. It's not the scheme or anything. It's just he doesn't have the dudes. Like that that national title team and the really even the team that lost to UMBC that was just as good. I mean, the, the NBA guys they had the athleticism they had, the, the role players, the Diakites, like they don't have those guys. And if it's going to be the Kihei Clark and Jaden Gardner show, like that's that's rough. And Gardner made his living in the American, just kind of bullying his way through. And that always worked against like the South Floridas uh, and against the, the two lanes, but it never worked against Houston. You know, one, one game, I think it did. But to say, go be the guy, be, go be the 28% usage guy in this offense, I don't see it. And if Kihei is the second option, I mean, where, where is this going? Yeah, uh, Gavin and I have not been Kihei fans uh, for a while. So I laughed because that was also my team, and I knew that I was going to get shit for it. But it's I promise it's not because I'm a tech fan. Uh, you, you just look at this roster. So it's just such a massive exodus of talent over the last two years. You know, and that's a credit to to Tony Bennett, right? Like he's picking up guys and getting them drafted or, you know, they're going to play in Europe. But I mean, this team loses Sam Hauser, Morcel, who we just talked about going NC State, Jay Huff, who was just a unique piece, um, Trey Murphy, who was a lottery pick. Um, yeah. And so they bring in Armand Franklin, who I think is just kind of a meh player. Um maybe a glue guy, but I don't know. Um, yeah. Like, like you said, it's, it, it's Kihei Clark, it's Jaden Gardner. And then they're relying on like Beekman and Caden Shedrick to be like third and fourth options on this team. Um, I, I know everyone's just closing their eyes and putting this team fourth in ACC because of Bennett, but it's just tough for me to get there with this roster. Um, and I'm sure just like, you know, so we're, we're doing an ACC pod and, and, and we're low on like the two best coaches in the league. So, you know, that probably what could go wrong. Yeah. yeah, that probably. Won't. <laughs> but my last point is it's hard to play a style that has a fine line of error when you just can't score. And I think that's going to catch up to them um, a few more times this year than it usually does. I'm open to the possibility that this is like Trey Murphy two years ago came from Maine, had to sit out here. No one expected. I mean, Trey Murphy was like a fine player at a bottom of the barrel American East team, but no one expected he'd turn into what he is. So there's a chance that one of these guys who barely played like Kafaro or Shedrick, someone like Beekman or something like that. Their, their player development, uh, that staff is really good at getting improving guys. There could be a guy who pops up out of nowhere. I'm totally open to that, but it, it's just, it just feels like too thin of a roster. What do you think, Gav? Yeah, I'm fine with it. It's, uh, 
I mean, you, we just hit on UVA perfectly. You know, the, when you race to 50, uh, you, you can get by on kind of a season long, you know, basis night in and night out, trying to just grind teams to a dust. Uh, but when it's when it's full effort, full intensity uh, in the NCAA tournament and teams are more urgent, you know, to score and it's a lot of times a little bit faster pace. Uh, yeah, they have a, they a lot of times have a ceiling. And so I think we're going to we're going to see a couple uh, of those teams this year coming out of the ACC as well. Yeah. So I think that kind of worked out because we we touched on most of the teams in the league. So I want to move on to who we think are going to be like the breakout players of the ACC. So this is, you know, this is important for DFS, but it's also important for sports betting, um, kind of identifying who on these rosters are due for an uptick in minutes or who, you know, maybe they were behind someone last year or they're a freshman. Um, so we'll start with you, John. Uh, give me a breakout player or two that you like in the ACC. Yeah, I don't know what his pricing. I mean, you guys are the DFS guy. I played years ago before it got banned, college got banned in uh, Pennsylvania. But I don't know how many people really saw Paul Atkinson at Yale. I mean, he was a no mm-hmm. player of the year. But, you know, there's like in this offense with the way they can spread the floor, he can go for like 18 and eight a night. I wouldn't be surprised if he's, he's kind of up there uh, by the end of the season. That one feels kind of obvious uh, beyond him. Maybe there's a guy at Wake who kind of breaks out. Uh, there's there's enough competition there that it's not clear. But it, you you may see Steve Forbes in year two when he finally has an offseason, has a real offseason this time. He uncovers somebody. I mean, his dude's a really good coach. I mean, his track record is at East Tennessee State was impeccable. Uh, one of these guys at Wake, whether it's uh, LaRavia or uh, I, I can't blank it on a couple of the other guys, but yeah, we is- we played a little too much Carter Witt too early last year. Just, just was too young, not ready. Um, I think Wake's an interesting team just because they have so many new pieces. Um, I think DFS wise, we we might have to wait and see uh, roles kind of settle. Uh, we played some Alondis at Oklahoma, just like an Uber athlete guy. Um, but yeah, I I I didn't even. Th- think of the Atkinson one when I was coming up with my list. I think that's an awesome one. Um, played him on a lot of the Friday night slates, you know, at the Ivy league. So, um, Gavin, give me one and, you know, we'll just kind of go around the circle. Yeah. I, I like Atkinson because I think he compliments, uh, Lizuski's game really well too, in terms of a high, low, uh, big man tandem that potentially gives him a little more length to maybe God forbid, play a little bit of defense for Notre Dame, but <laughs> no, please uh, don't. <laughs> I, I mentioned I mentioned him earlier. Um, I think a guy who sees a pretty large step up in terms of minutes, role, and I think which allows you know that to kind of blossom his talents a little bit. I, I think, like I mentioned before, is uh, Anthony Walker over at uh, at Miami. You know, a guy who was who was real productive uh, when he had his spurts. You know, there, there was uh, as Miami was all last year, just a roulette of who was going to be uh, healthy. You know, on any, on any given night, but. He, he definitely had some games where, I mean, he really carried, you know, the team for the most part in a game where if, if Wong was in foul trouble or um, was on an off night or, or, you know, being defended by a good guy uh, or a good defender, you know, he had some really good spurts. He can rim run. Um, like I said, he's fast twitch. He can rebound, gives him some upside on the defensive end in terms of, you know, what kind of effort can he put in to be a good defender? I think he's a real interesting piece uh, for Miami and doesn't have to, you know, run into the kind of, playing time uh, conundrum of how it's going to work with Charlie Moore, Mcgusty and uh, Isaiah Wong. Yeah. That's a good point there. You know, just I think benefits from a lot of those three guys without, uh, you know, being redundant. Yeah. The guys who have just clear paths to big time playing time uh, are, that definitely helps. Um, the number one guy I'd have, I mentioned him earlier is Mark Williams. I think he's just going to have an absolutely monster year. Um, I don't know why Kay was hesitant to play him last year. Um, but I just don't see him not having just like a, like a awesome season, uh, prime role, you know, we'll be using him early and often in DFS. If they start, if he fucking starts Theo John over Mark Williams oh, on opening night, I'm going to swan dive out my window. He's not um, going to not start Theo. Yep. <laughs> no, there's no way he starts Theo John. Come on. <laughs> he can't. Um, and then my second one, um, I think I think this is one of Gavin's guys, uh, Jalen Withers from Louisville. I thought he had a pretty underrated freshman season. 
Um, Louisville's pretty weak inside besides him. Um, you know, Malik Williams is there, but he's struggled to stay healthy the last year plus. Uh, I think an uptick in minutes from like the 25 a game he had last year and, and he could explode um, 0.88 fantasy points per minute as a freshman. Um, really solid. Uh, so Withers would, would be my second guy. I'm going to throw out another upperclassman up transfer for a different reason. Naz Bohannon was incredibly productive at Youngstown State on a pretty bad team every year. Uh, and he has no competition for minutes. I mean, he's he's the four, he's the five, he's whatever he wants to be. And Clemson's offense is so disjointed anyway. It's kind of you got to go do your own thing. And he is one of the most relentless rebounders. He's undersized. He's like 6'6", maybe, like 240. But dude's a beast. I mean, he's going to put up a bunch of double-doubles. I don't Again, I don't know what pricing will be like, but he's a pretty physical player for events. He'll be cheap early, so – yeah, Clemson's problem Break is their that offense one down, is yeah. devoid of their <laughs> offense is devoid of skillful offensive players. That's that's Clemson's issue. Um, but yeah, you you kind of alluded to Louisville. That might have been you know one of the the better teams that we surely uh, we didn't touch on a ton. You know, I, I think that that backcourt, frankly, coming off of Carly Jones and David Johnson to uh, to to Jerry West, who's solid at Marshall, and I, I think Noah Locke is super uninspiring. You know, that backcourt is definitely taking a step back. But the front court, I mean, you know, Withers, uh, Sam, Sam Williamson, and Malik Williams, guy. man, <laughs> if, if that if that front line can stay healthy, you know, it's it's not a super imposing, uh, just paint demolishing interior defense, but it's a lot of – there's a lot of switchability and versatility between those three guys um, in terms of how you play them. It, it's, I think it's kind of an interesting thing. And Chris Mack is obviously a solid coach, so definitely got to keep your eye on Louisville, even though we didn't uh, touch on them a whole lot. And the wild card there is the the Juco transfer Ellis. Who knows? I mean, Juco is yeah. a complete crapshoot, so who knows what he'll be. But that that could kind of be the fulcrum that makes them yeah. you know, get or yeah. Um, they get Matt Cross too. Maybe you know if yeah, if Matt I liked Cross him is in a better mental spot uh, from yeah. Miami. Uh, he had a he had kind of a weird sure. falling out with them, um, but you know he could certainly be a serviceable guy. Yeah. So so the last guy I had for breakout um, is Baycott, but I think he's probably too obvious. Um, I just wanted to make sure that we mentioned him because he if he comes out of the gate playing 20 to 30 minutes, he's going to just absolutely smash DFS slates. Um, so we'll see where he's priced early. Hopefully it's you know not up with the elite players in the country. I don't think it will be. So I think that we're going to be playing him early and often. Uh, did, did you guys have anyone else written down for the breakout before we move on to the impact newcomers? Yeah. Nope. All right. So I can send Walker Williams. Yep. So my first impact newcomer is Dawson Garcia, who we uh, touched on a bit earlier. So I'll keep it brief. Um, like Gavin said, just a perfect systematic fit with Baycott Uh Thought he was real good during his freshman season at Marquette where some weird shit was going on with that team and their rotations and questionable play outside of him. We weren't big DJ Carden fans. Um, and yeah, you know, he stretched the floor instead of having three trees inside for UNC. So I, I think that's a great fit. Yeah, this one, I, I was going to say, uh, I don't want to sound like the like a wake homer because I'm I'm certainly not I'm no higher on them than the market is but uh, I wanted to point out they're not going to wow anybody in a stat sheet I mean they're not going to score a whole lot but Wake's interior defense this year is worlds better than it was last year they brought in Dallas Walton from Colorado seven foot rim protector Jake Larabia as a four man who could score from Indiana State pretty decent defender too their interior defense last year was a sieve and that was so unforbes like but he didn't have a chance to get any of his schemes implemented and they were so young. So that to me, from just from a betting perspective, I, I got to take a closer look at where these totals are going to open. But early in the season, the offense is still going to be really bad. Take a look at the wake unders as, as Forbes is a defense first coach. Uh, these could be some pretty grisly games. Gavin, what do you got for newcomers? <clears throat> yeah, I had uh, number one, I think is Dawson Garcia, you know, Atkinson we touched on. And then, you know, I, you got to go with Caleb Mills, but you know, Leonard's got to unlock him and allow him to play, you know, think about what Houston would have had when Jarreau was going through his injuries, Yeah, uh, you know, late in the season with a guy like Caleb Mills, who can not only shoot can score off the bounce, legit three level score, big body from the guard position has combo guard capabilities, can handle it, can play off ball. 
Um, you know, I think certainly going to be going to be one at, at Florida State. Um, but yeah, I think Gar- Garcia was the going away uh, certain Im- new impact guy that I had here. Yeah, I've I've two more written down. You know, we probably can't do an ACC preview without talking about Paulo Bencaro from Duke. Um, we don't know that as much about the freshman Gavin and I, but you know, he's seemingly like a transcendent talent, head on straight. Unlike a Jalen Johnson last year, he was a highly tatted guy who kind of flamed out. Uh, consensus preseason player of the year. Can't wait to see him play. Maybe John knows a little more about him. Um, have you seen him much, John? I have only seen the stuff I think everybody else has seen, these like 20-second clips you know, on Twitter or, or on YouTube. So I'm, as, I'm open to the possibility that he is this transcendent Zion-like talent. Uh, and, and surprisingly for Duke, that's not really being priced in. They're like a top 10, top 12-ish team. And normally you'd think they'd be crazy overrated. Uh, this guy's going to get the full ESPN treatment, presumably. He's going to get the promos and the ads and all that. Uh, so if he is that, and with the other pieces around him, yeah, I, I, I'm i kind of buying it. But it, it does feel, it always feels weird when you name a fr- true freshman the player of the year in a conference. Yeah, for sure. Like so kind of betting on especially like, in a conference like the ACC. Right. right. That's what I was going to say. <laughs> well, to be fair, last year they went with Garrison Brooks. So they just went with the opposite end of the spectrum. Yeah. <laughs> so the last guy I had written down is Storm Murphy. Um, you probably yeah. have watched more of him than I have, John. Uh, but just from what I've read and seen, it's hard to think of a better replacement for Wabisa Beatty, who I thought really held us back last season. Um, literally could not shoot, you know, with, with him and um, Radford on the floor at the same time, uh, just seemed like kind of an awkward fit with the rest of the team. Uh, Storm's been 40 plus percent from three on a good number of attempts per game for his entire career. Um, man, I hate that boots left that stinks, but this team is just going to be able to shoot, from one to five. And I think that he probably starts the year pretty cheap in DFS. And I think he's going to be a pretty big cog of this team. What do you think, John? I think the top six or so for the Hokies is like top three good in the league. Like that starting five can certainly beat anyone. Can certainly beat Duke. There's no doubt they can, but really not much depth there. Uh, and the offense, sometimes it's, it's kind of a one trick pony. Like it's this great ball movement. It's the ball is always moving around, but you know, it doesn't feel like sometimes there's kind of a plan B. I hope there's more in the tank for Aluma. Like last year was the breakout. I hope he has another level, uh, even beyond that, in which case their ceiling rises even more. But yeah, I'm a big Storm Murphy fan. And he's not the slouch. You look at him, he's kind of the scrawny, undersized guy. He's not a slouch defensively. He's actually pretty good uh, moving laterally. So uh, that was a great addition. And I, I'm sure you didn't like Wubisa Beatty, and I certainly didn't either. So yeah. God. If Aluma has another gear, man, that, yeah. that is going to be a scary dude this year. Oh, like, yeah, man. He was that, awesome. That's the part that feels weird to me. Like, we, we've we seen Aluma and what he could do. And, and we're saying, okay, uh, Banchero is better than that. Yeah, I don't know. It, it's hard for me to get there. Yeah, I mean, I haven't seen any um, books come out with, like, player of the year bets. Um, I'll probably bet Aluma if there's a line that makes sense. Um, the guy I'm hoping has another gear is Mutz. I'm a big Justin Mutz guy, just, uh, kind of like a Swiss army knife, um, from Delaware, I think. Um, so let's, let's wrap up the ACC. Um, just quickly give our all conference team. I'll go first. Uh, mine is Isaiah Wong, Aluma, Ben Caro, Baycott, and Mark Williams, baby. I got to stay on the Mark Williams train. Um, we're going to have a monster year. Gavin? I knew you were going to put a Luma in there, but I went, I thought the, I thought the bigs were relatively set in terms of Boncaro and uh, Armando Baycott. I, I just think our Baycott just has a, a dumb year this year. And then I thought the real decision came down to which of the four guards are you going to go with between Prentice Hub, Buddy Beheim, Michael DeBow, and Isaiah Wong. And personally, with having Charlie Moore, you know, a, a ball dominant point with having a guy like McGusty, who is going to take, you know, some of the volume. I don't know if Wong puts up the numbers 
especially the numbers he put up last year when he was the True. the only you know option of that team. I think it, he takes a step back numbers wise, which probably looks a little bit worse and potentially keeps him off. Whereas Debo has no competition and is going to be the dude you know for them. And same with Buddy. Yeah, Debo's gonna be awesome. I'm. I'm less concerned about having like three guards and two forwards on my team. I just want the five best players in the league. Who do you yep. think are the five best players in the league, John? <laughs> my own, Steve, I would go with four of your five. I'm going to, I'm going to sub in for Mark Williams, Atkinson. I think this off the Bray offense every year, uh, Ken Palm has a sixth in offensive efficiency that feels a little high, but he runs such great offense every year. And Atkinson, you know, we haven't seen him in two years, but dude is super, super skilled. And in that offense, he's going to feast with all the shooting they have around him. So, and I think Bray needs a way to kind of take the ball. I mean, not take the ball away from Prentice Hub, but to spread it out a little more. Hub sometimes was just too too much of a gunner. It felt like he was creating too much. So I think Atkinson gives him some of the playthrough. Yeah, love that. I and, and keep just, in mind, keep, oh, real quick, Steve. Keep in mind, John. Uh, I'm pretty sure that last year's Notre Dame team was the worst Ken Palm defensive efficiency rating that Mike Bray has had in his entire, I don't know if it's entire coaching career last 20 years, but you know, that's part of the reason why I want to think it's somewhat of an anomaly. And, you know, we, we talked about the Anthony Solomon thing. So yeah, I'm, I'm kind of with, you know, the Atkinson play surely a, a, another kind of, you know, stone nut fit in terms of scheme and what, what is around them. Yeah. I, I like it. Yeah. And I like We're pretty uh, different though. Yeah. I do like that. And I, I don't know. I I like having one surprise in there. So mine's Mark. Yours is Atkinson. Gavin had no surprises. Actually, maybe DeVoe. I like DeVoe. You know, we played him a lot last year. Man, Georgia Tech. We uh, So, John, we had the 25-1 to 1 Georgia Tech to win the uh, ACC tournament bet that we sweat out in Vegas last year. So that was awesome. Um, uh, was it Florida State who got bounced from the – or no, Duke got bounced from the tournament because of COVID, right? Yeah, yeah. Tech beat Florida State. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Great, great run. Um, so let's move on to the Big East. Um, we have about, I don't know, 45 minutes to an hour left, so plenty of time. Um, Big East, uh, the media poll is Nova, UConn, Xavier, St. John's, Seton Hall, Butler, Providence, Creighton, Marquette, Georgetown, and DePaul. Uh, I think the Big East is pretty interesting this year. Um, outside of the top one, maybe two. Uh, I think the rest of the league, there's there's a lot of variability with a lot of these teams, personally. Um, John, who are you high on in the Big East? Yeah, I was high last year. And for a while, it, it, I think I was right. And then after that, it kind of just fell apart. But I'm, I'm still in on Seton Hall with Kevin Willard. Uh, I'm, I was a big fan of his offseason and what they did. As much as I liked Mamu last year, I mean, he, he was doing too much. He was up around like 29, 30% usage. And he was a unique talent as this like kind of sort of a four, sort of a five combo with passing skills. But I think this year they just have a lot more balance with the guys they brought in. Uh, and Willard, I, I posted this last year and it, it didn't hold up as well, but uh, Willard has this ridiculous track record as an underdog, which is typically when I try and back him. I'll have to pull the stat up. Uh, but but he's the kind of coach that because he's such a good game planner, he can keep his team in the game against superior competition. Uh, I, I think the market's probably 10 to 15 points too low, spots too low on them. Yeah, so I'll go next because my team was also Seton Hall. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, we lost or they lost maybe the most fun player in, in college basketball. I love Sandro. Uh, Gavin, we probably played him more than anyone else. Oh. In the country last year yeah um, there was nobody bigger on Sandro than us yeah so John we were on him early knowing that he was probably going to step into like a huge usage role um so that paid off big but um that's that's really all they lost you know they lost him and Shavar who I didn't think was that good um and like you said I think they maybe relied on him too much I think this is a better quote-unquote you know team than than they had last year uh this is now Jared Roden's team who I think is really freaking good um I think he takes off this year you know you got Obiagu inside who's a freaking brick wall um impossible score on he had 
Gavin, he, he had almost three blocks a game in 21 minutes a game. That's, that is insane. Um, yeah. They also but, bring in Alexis Yetna, man. I mean, that's a, that's a legit interior force too. Uh, that's a great player from South Florida to compliment Obiago as well. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I was, I was, I was going to ask John about him. Yeah. Um, but real quick, I think we kind of buried the lead. They picked up Kadari Richmond from Syracuse, who I think is just awesome. Um, how Beheim let him leave. He's like the perfect fit for the top of the zone defensively. Uh, I think that he, uh, well, I'll talk about m- more about him in the breakout player section. <laughs> Give me something uh, about Yetna, John, because I haven't seen him much. He was, I guess it would have been three seasons ago. He was the American Athletic Conference Rookie of the Year. Came out of nowhere. I think put up, I don't remember the numbers were, but like, I think he averaged a double-double really close to it. And then I think he blew out his knee. He said all kinds of injury troubles, but he's a pretty unique uh, sort of, I mean, he's got some shooting ability, but he's just a really tenacious rebounder. He's a great fit there. Uh, you know, his ceiling is part of what could lift them. And the other guy, I can't believe we're still doing this, but if Bryce, I know, I know, I knew he was going going there. (laughs) It's killing me. But like, if he's even 60% of what he was at, at Harvard, this dude's like an electric, uh, six man option who could change a game. Yeah. So John, we, uh, we do a Google doc for, for each team that has like the projected contributors and stuff and, you know, their stats and notes. I just copied and pasted Aiken's note from last season. <laughs> Gavin, no um, where are you on? We'll Seton- will be serious, you know, contributor. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right. Uh, where are you on Seton hall? And then give us your, uh, high on team in the big East. Yeah, um, the high on team. We'll get there in a second. Um, yeah, I, I tend to be high on Xavier. There's see the the way the Big East breaks down is there's Nova, and then you got kind of three relatively similar stylistic teams in, in terms of uh, Xavier, UConn, and Seton Hall. I, I tend to be a little bit more on the Xavier side. With, I'm a big Paul Scruggs guy. I think Scruggs and Fremantle is probably the best tandem in the conference. Um, it, you know, Nate Johnson, Colby Jones around them, super serviceable pieces. I think Seton Hall is probably next behind them. Um, and then UConn. So I'd say I'm, I'm probably, you know, relatively close to the field on Seton Hall, but brother, you want to talk about ugly. This is, this is going to be ugly, but a team that I am oh, no. high on <laughs> Butler. Oh no. That's yes. A... Yes. Oh, shit. coming off their worst season oh, in, no. in pretty much 20 years. You know, they battled injuries to their main guys in Aaron Thompson, Bo Hodges. Bryce Enzi is still probably around a a top 20-ish player in the conference for me. You know, Golden is slower than an 18-wheeler U-turning in a one-lane street, but he's still serviceable as a big man in terms of sticking his fat butt in the paint, being a good rebounder, scoring putbacks, not quite the rim runner, um, but – I think getting a healthy Aaron Thompson the entire way, you know, they bring back 92% of the minutes, you know, returning from their team, which I think is second to UCLA in the country. And not only are they returning minutes, but they're returning much healthier minutes too. And I think like Bo Hodges is a pretty unique piece that uh, could, can be utilized in a couple of different ways. There's, there's a lot of different, like I'm about to say, just pieces um, on this team. I'd be curious to how they fit together, but I tend to think that they can't really perform as poorly as they did last year, kind of similar to like a Miami take a why I'm high on them. I just think they come in a little bit undervalued, uh, especially with a lot more cohesion than people probably realize coming off that injury world season. Go ahead, John. I I have, I have Butler as the team that I'm low on. (laughs) (laughs) You know, in a vacuum, I don't, I don't disagree with Gavin. I think there's, there's some things to like. The problem is that I think it's already priced in. Like they finished last year, 120th in Ken Bomb. They had this awful calamitous run of injuries and COVID problems, everything. It was a Murphy's law season for sure, but they opened this year 55th. So like this bounce back is already priced in. I I just don't see it. The market seems to already know it's coming. And this to me is kind of like the maxed out team in a lot of ways, like NZ and Golden are serviceable, decent bigs for sure. Uh, but like they're old, you know what they are at this point. And unless one of the younger guards, one of the young guards could break out for sure. And that to me is what could lift them beyond what they are. But Aaron Thompson, like, did he learn to shoot this off season? I doubt it. Like he's a good point guard and a good defender, but I don't know. I just pick and roll. Like he was really bad in the pick and roll too, which kind of worries you. Um, 
but yeah, I, I 100% hear what you're saying. Makes yeah. sense. So, Gavin, I'll start with Xavier, who I think you said you you had as the team that you're higher on besides Butler. I, I have think been second in the conference behind Nova. I am scared as shit about this Fremantle foot thing. Like, he's still in a walking boot. Just big guys with foot injuries, I just – I usually don't try to fuck with. Um, like, it, they just always seem to linger – even after they come back, I, I love Fremantle, but um, I think the reason that, that you're buying them as a top two team is because of Scruggs and Fremantle. And if it's Scruggs and, you know, everyone else, I'm not sure they're a top three team. Um, yeah. John, what- Nate Johnson had an un- unworldly three point shooting year last year too, in terms of efficiency, he has to take a step back just from a regression standpoint. Yeah. Um, but yeah, if, if Fremantle's hurt and, you know, dealing with that, that foot injury all year, then, then they're to the win, you know, so be it. Um, but I think, I think as the highest upside of any other team, not named Nova in that conference. I can buy that. What do you think, John? Yeah, I agree on the upside. This is the team maybe nationally that I want to like the most. Cause I look at the roster, it's clearly Steele's best roster. That what kills me is that, well, the Fremantle thing would be a devastating blow like that, that knocks them down, uh, it's got to be you know, 40, 50 spots, something crazy. He's so key at both ends. I like the Nunji addition in the offseason to bring in a true five. They hit to play Fremantle at the five a lot last year, and that works offensively with the shooting, but he took a beating defensively against some big centers. So to have Nunji come in for you know, 10, 15 minutes a game would be great. It's just every guy on this roster, for the most part, other than Scruggs, it's, it's like they're good at one thing, and that's it. Like Kunkel is a shooter. Uh, Odom, defender. Like you, There's very little versatility. Yeah. Do you think – so if Fremantle's out to start the season, because this is going to be big for DFS, do you think Nunji can give you like 25 minutes a game? Or do you think he's more of a bench piece on a good team? Yeah, the injury is a big – I don't know. I think more like 17, 18, something. Maybe they try and get away with playing small for a while. Yeah. So to bounce back to Butler, um, John, this was going to be my first example of a team that's – rolling the balls back out with the same dude. So I think all kind of suck. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if these guys weren't good last year, yeah, they dealt with some injuries, but I just, I just don't like the pieces. Like, you know, all of these other teams that we're talking about, we, we like their upside because of a couple guys who might break out or get better, or you just see some upsides with them. Bo Hodges is already hurt again. Um, I think it's his knee, you know, so I think he's their best player. So he's out at least to start the year. And then to kind of circle back to the DFS sheet that we have, um, this entire team, Gavin, is under 0.75 fantasy points per minute with uh, your favorite, John, we call them wind sprinters, guys who just don't do anything while, while they're on the court. Jair Bolden, 0.57 fantasy points per minute. I think that's got to be bottom I don't know, three or five in yeah, guys who play 32 minutes, score four and a half points a game, have, you know, yeah. a half a rebound and two assists. Yeah. Those are the wind sprinters and uh, Butler's got like six of them. So uh, I don't know. I, I, I think it's a combination of that. Like me not seeing the upside. And then I'm looking at the teams that are projected behind them. And I kind of like the upside a little bit more just because there's more variance, like a team like Creighton, who's going to be super young but clearly I think has more talent than, uh, than Butler does. Um, so John, who did you have as a team that you're low on? Or well, do- I was going to say Butler, but that, that really does. <laughs> uh, God, just dig the knife deeper guys. Go yeah. Ahead. Right. Go ahead. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll die on a hill. Trust me. Georgetown opens 76, which yeah, 76 is like kind of NIT, middle of the NIT, NIT bubble. Uh, unless these freshmen are really good, I'm not seeing it. I, I think they could be right back in the basement with the Paul if it doesn't work out. That was such – you can't call it a fluke necessarily last year because they earned it. Like the defense was awesome down the stretch, but it was awesome because of the guys that they've now lost. Uh, you know, I, Javon Blair and – Wow. Well, I mean, they turned into <laughs> – those defensive players and they also had some shooting there was a little bit of shooting luck uh at both ends but you know i, I don't think ewing has all of a sudden like figured it out he, he's still running some awful offense i uh, look it could be totally wrong i'm open to being wrong about them but if they're ninth and DePaul's 10th 
that seems reasonable. Yeah. A guy that they lost to Gavin and I were high on all year was Pickett. Uh, just like a, again, a Swiss army knife piece that I don't see on their current roster. Um, Gavin, did we go through your team that you're low on? Oh, one, one last thing on Georgetown, uh, John, uh, Ken Palm has him 76, Bart Torvik has him 125. So that's it's just like a huge discrepancy between those two sites that you don't really see too often. Now, I, there's, a, there's a couple. I didn't, I didn't notice that one. There's a couple others I've seen between them. But 125 sounds closer than 76. Yeah, yeah, same. Gav? Yeah, I was going to take an unpopular approach and basically say which one of these kind of th- – this these three tier two teams am I down on and – Butler. It does. It, it does. No, Butler's not in the tier two. I'm talking uh, Xavier, Seton Hall, and UConn, and and it, it doesn't feel good. But I'm a little bit down on UConn from where they're standing right now at, at uh, eight. Uh, well, I guess they're they're 18 in Bartorvik, but 21 in in Ken Palm. And this this is scary because I, I mean this is one of the uh, most lethal defensive potential units in the country. Part of it is that I'm just not a Hurley guy in, in terms of I don't think the Hurley, the Hurley boys are that great at coaches. I think it's a lot more hype than, than substance, but that being said, it, it's, I think it's another team that just has a little bit of a diminished offensive ceiling that, you know, in conference play, they probably take care of, you know, most of the teams that they're better than because of that, you know, defensive uh, switchability and versatility. You talk about Tyrese Martin, you talk about, Isaiah Whaley, uh, Andre Jackson is no joke uh, at the at the guard position as a stout kind of you know bigger body, and then uh, a cock a cock you know th- he's got he's coming back from the Achilles uh, in his second year so he should be in much better shape and was you know an, an all world defender kind of his freshman year that he showed us so the the unit can be good um, and, and like I said they probably do find in conference but I think it's a team that probably doesn't make the second round. Uh, or, or sorry, doesn't make the Sweet 16 and has to do with the offensive, uh, you know, lack of ceiling. Without Book Knight, you know, they played fine uh, for stretches in terms of the year when when he was out with his elbow injury. But, you know, who takes the last shot? R.J. Cole? You know, it, probably not Tyrese Martin. It sure as hell ain't Whaley. So it's I, – I don't know. I don't like yeah. – I don't like kind of the go-to score at the end of the game. I'm not big on R.J. Cole probably compared to the market. I think he's very much more like uh, Mike Smith uh, in terms of mold and kind of – serviceability usability to his team but yeah that's kind of where i'm at with uconn it, it, it doesn't feel great so, because of how good a defense they are so john just real quick the first thing that jumped out to me is he said they're 18 and 21 at uh bartorvik and ken palm that kind of seems like they're ceiling to me i just don't see this team like a top 10 12 team what do you think no i agree and even if the defense is <laughs> again like top eight top 10 that's fine but we're, we're, what's the offensive ceiling i mean yeah. 50- Really? We're going to find out a lot pretty early with them because they go to the battle for Atlantis. And I'm just looking at the bracket. They open with Auburn and then their second game is either Michigan State or Loyola. So they're going to get the hyper tempo, the shot block and the athleticism with Auburn. And then they jump right to a next game with two really strong defenses. So that's that's a yeah. amazing game. But I think it's going to give us some answers as to whether Cole is the guy or he's really just kind of the 1B option. Yeah, I, I, I think – like Gavin said, the defense gives them the floor. I'm not sure if their ceiling is anything above where they're ranked preseason. Um, let's let's transition into the uh, breakout players. Uh, I'll go first since I mentioned Creighton earlier as a team that I think um, might be a little bit better than they're projected in the standings. Um, Ryan Kalkbrenner from Creighton. Um, this is a guy who you know who's kind of eased in last year. Um, on an absolutely loaded roster. Um, we were super high on Creighton. Love to see them make the Sweet 16 after everyone talks shit about them for two weeks to end the year. And then they just ran into Gonzaga, you know. Um, re- really like that team. But, yeah, he, you know, he, he was, what, you know, the seventh or eighth player on that team. Now they lose everyone. Um, you know, they lose Zeg. They lose Balak. They, they lose Mahoney. They lose Jefferson. They lose Bishop. And he's kind of like the last man standing with this group of a pretty, uh, you know, um, highly touted recruits. But um, so he played 13.8 minutes per game last year, 0.96 fantasy points per minute. 
You know, this is, this is a guy who could be, um, and, and this might be more of like a DFS lean than a, he's going to be an awesome player lean, but if, if, if his minutes jump, he's going to be cheap. And this could be, you know, a guy who averages, I don't know, like 11 and, and eight or something like that, you know, with a, a block or two a game, which is going to be pretty valuable for what I think his price is going to be. Um, what do you guys think about Kalkbrenner? Yeah, I, I also probably Creighton could have some growing pains, but uh, Steve, you alluded to it before. I mean, this is probably just from recruiting pedigree and all that kind of stuff. This is one of McDermott's most talented on paper teams. It's going to take a while, but I mean, his offense, the, the stuff he runs is so good. Uh, it, it's going to be there. Call is going to have a shitload of opportunities. I, I'm in on that just from, just from a numbers perspective. Yeah. Gav, yeah. what do you think? And then uh, give us one too. The, uh, the baby Jays, you know, it's, it's going to be interesting. The, the thing about Calprenner that we didn't mention that we, we have to is that he was such an odd man out in terms of that scheme of – you talked about the five guys that they just lost. That was such a uniquely put together teams in terms of the maturity and how the skill sets meshed. And when you have guys like Bishop, Mahoney, and Jefferson who can play, who can guard, you know, pretty much one through five, you know, minus a, a super explosive on-ball point guard. Um, it, it, it was really hard to kind of fit him in. And how does he, how does he slot in? Even if he comes in for Jefferson or, or Mahoney, you know, at the, at the first whistle or in foul trouble, what does he do in that team that, you know, is really a five out kind of relies on the Christian Bishop uh, pick and roll rim run uh, with Zagorowski coming off it and trying to look for Balik. So it will be interesting. I think it's, it's hard to argue. Um, the the uptick in terms of usage and, and minutes that he's going to get so uh, certainly agree with you but yeah I, I don't know much about these freshmen I was a, a freshman athlete at one year in my life and I know that freshmen are like uh, bags of tea you never know what you get with them until you put them in hot water so I don't know much about the the other you know freshmen coming in I do know that call printer is is pretty serviceable could be a usable if not elite interior defensive guy if he can keep his feet moving uh, certainly like it uh, in terms of where you're coming from but my guy, you know, I, I think this was a little bit tougher in terms of, you know, who's who's really going to break out in this conference, and, and this might be somewhat biased, but my pick is is Justin Lewis, partially from a battle of attrition standpoint in terms of, you know, we talked about Dawson Garcia and how much Marquette um, is losing, and I, I'm not a big shock of smart guy by any stretch of the imagination, but Justin Lewis, another kind of uh, – kind of the, the Anthony Walker kind of mold of a quick twitchy athletic explosive can, can shoot outside, can still rebound and bang in. It has the size to do it. Um, can step out in the pick and roll game. Uh, I don't know what, you know, shock is going to try and do with the pieces that he's got, but I think Justin Lewis takes a pretty good step forward. He was injured a good portion of last year, had some games where, you know, he shined, but that whole Marquette team um, was just, I think, you know, underwhelming as a whole. And, probably fell victim a little bit to a, uh, you know, sinking of, of tides. So we'll see. I, I like him uh, to take a good step forward this year. Yeah. Yeah. And he was kind of in that weird minutes rotation with Jamal Kane and stuff. Who's, who's now gone. Jamal Kane. Yeah. So John, uh, Gavin played Justin Lewis probably more than he should have last year in DFS. So he's just got to get that back. Right. Um, what, what do you think about Lewis? And then uh, give us one. That's wrong court. I mean, whatever minutes allocation he can handle, he's getting all those minutes because there, there's really not much else there. He, he's going to, and assuming he's in better shape, which I'm, I'm assuming he is after, you know, the off season, he, he's going to, I think he puts up monster numbers. Shock his offenses have kind of been hit or miss. He's, I don't, in recent memory, I can't think of one that was particularly great. Like it's a lot of dribbling. It's a lot of, a lot of pick and roll. And, you know, that that's, that's fine for him because I think he'll be a pretty good role guy. Pretty, I, I'm assuming he's going to be a decent shooter as a, a pop guy. Uh, so I like that. I mentioned this guy before. I was trying to hold some of it back, but yet, nah, everyone says he's fully healthy, drawing all the rave reviews in practice. And look, it's it's the offseason hype. We're all used to hearing the smoke screens, but I'm in on this. If he's full go, I think he's a total game changer for Seton Hall. And he's such a stat stuffer, the rebounds, the points, the blocks. Uh, it, there's a big ceiling here be uh sneaky and dfs those uh 100 yep yeah. what, what we call the peripherals add up quick and that's what 
basically makes the difference between a guy who's, you know, guys who are pure score, you know, like a Carly Jones. Um, he really has to give you a lot scoring or else he's just not going to pay off. So, um, yeah, I do like that one. Uh, the second one I wrote down uh, is Posh Alexander. Um, man, what a what a cool guy to watch, right? Uh, just like balls to the effing wall the entire time. It's crazy to think he was only a three star recruit last year, and I feel like the the hype was was more than you usually see from a three star guy. Uh, but I mean, the way he played was, you know, he definitely earned it. You have to think he kind of takes that next step here um, unless for whatever awful reason they decide to give Aaron Wheeler more minutes than they should. Um, this team lost a lot of guard minutes, you know, with Rasheem Dunn leaving, Vinnie Cole, guys like that. Um, so I think, you know, this is, you know, they have Champagny there who is a better overall player, but, you know, this is, this is Posh's team, I think. Uh, and I think that he's, he's going to have an awesome year. Uh, Gav, what do you think about Posh? And um, if if you have any more breakout guys, let us know. Yeah, he's he's literally the the carbon copy epitome of your nose to the grindstone, gritty New York City point guard man. Like, and and if he didn't break out last year, and he's about to break out even more this year, my God, that, that's that's going to be a scary proposition. I mean, yeah, he he took the the Big East by storm. Um, in terms of he fits so well in in that up and down system um, and was such a, a good point guard early like you know does he does he probably control the ball a little bit better you know with one more year of experience does the game probably slow down sure I imagine um, now like I said but if he takes another step uh, yeah he's probably hunting first team uh, all conference then at that point awesome yeah. Uh, oh yeah John go ahead on posh I thought posh just when when you at least when I bet against them early in the year a couple of times, he was the most frustrating player to be against because he was so disruptive. And you look at this guy, he's built like a fire hydrant. You think, how is he just eating alive? He's pretty decent guards. Everybody remembers the Gillespie game when he just ate Gillespie's lunch. But no, I, I, he's another guy who, with a, a full offseason in better shape, in that system, I, it's, it's a system that is built for him in every possible way. Uh, another guy, just in terms of opportunity, not because I think he's particularly great, but from a fantasy perspective, Eric Dixon at Nova, there's nothing behind him at the five. Demir Cosby Roundtree is done career-wise. Uh, Nova last year, for, for the first time in a long time, could not defend anything at the rim. They need him on the floor. So if he's given them just decent block rate, pretty decent rebounding rate, doesn't need to score much. Uh, but just from a fantasy perspective, I think all those Nova wings kind of balance out and eat into each other's stat lines. He's the only one with a really clearly defined role, if he can handle it. Yeah, I think that's a good one. Um, Gavin, do you have any more before uh, we go over to the newcomers? I don't have any more, uh, but the, you know, the, all this Brandon Slater hubbub <laughs> and talk, help, help, me, help me see the light, John. It, no, we're just going to move on. We're not shocked up. Like, yeah, I, I, we're not Slater guys. Apparently, here. this guy's going to be the 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 six man, the dude of, the, of this team. I, I don't know, maybe, but I just I looked it up just now. I was looking for something with Dixon. Slater usage rate eleven percent. Yeah. So, no. Yeah, I mean, the thing with Dixon, I think that's a good one. Um, he's just got to stay on the floor and and not foul. Sometimes guys like that uh, can be frustrating but if he can stay on the floor i think that's a that's it's a great lean especially for dfs um so for the newcomers uh i basically only have one written down uh i had to really think for a second one uh but the one i had was a guy that i mentioned earlier in richmond from seton hall um i just think he's gonna be a monster uh he was so disruptive last year when they put him in over Gerard at uh, Syracuse um, really long and lengthy. He was awesome in like limited minutes. I think he played 21 a game, something like that. Uh, 0.85 fantasy points per minute. So, you know, he did, he just, he contributes across the board, which is going to give him a good floor. And if he ever learns how to score or shoot, he's just going to absolutely destroy. Um I think he's going to step right in, play a bunch of minutes at the point, probably. Uh, he's surrounded by six seniors on this team. So he's he's got a lot of support. 
and these are seniors that are good, Gavin, not the uh, Butler seniors. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, yeah, I'll be on him early and often in uh, DFS. What do you think about Richmond, John? Yeah, he's the one that I'm, I kind of get it. I, I'm not totally sure. It was, as you said, it was weird. One of you guys said it was so weird that Beheim let him go unless he was just so hell-bent on having a Beheim and Beheim backcourt that he thought Richmond was expendable. But that really was the perfect player at the top of the zone. And they don't, they haven't had a guy like that in a couple of years. It's been a long time since the days of Michael Carter-Williams and Brandon Trish and all those guys. So it was strange that they let him go. I just wonder if there's something more there. But if if there are no issues, then I completely agree that he's a game changer. Yep. Uh, Gav, any Richmond thoughts? And then give us a newcomer, because that was basically the only guy I had. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, uh, and Richmond didn't play. You know, Syracuse ran one of the most concentrated uh, minutes in terms of, you know, uh, yeah concentrated lineups in terms of minute allocation in the entire country. And somehow Kadari Richmond still could barely find himself, you know, into the rotation mostly. It was just weird. But I had I had him written down. I had Yetna written down. We've touched on them. So I'll go to the third one that I have. And that is Shaka's only hope in prayer at any form of relevancy in this conference. And that is Daryl Morcel coming over from Maryland. That's a good one. As not only what I imagine has to be probably the, the usage monster um, on the team, but in terms of also possessing, you know, serious leadership and kind of redshirt senior uh, intangible qualities that I think are going to be very useful for a team with a new coach coming in with a lot of new parts. Um, I think Marcel is definitely someone to look at and someone that Shaka is definitely uh, going to need this year. Yeah, and uh, he basically came out and said that he transferred because he wants to start a point guard. So I expect him to start a point here. You know, we'll see how that goes overall. Um, but, yeah, so, so the only other guy I had written down, just because he's a five-star, is Muhammad from Georgetown, and they really don't have anything else around him. So it seems like kind of a we're going to give him the keys and see if he's good type spot. But usually those five stars, at least for DFS, are priced up. And um, I don't know. He's surrounded by a bunch of wind sprinters, as we say. So, um, yeah, let's just let's let's go to the all conference team because we have about half hour left. Uh, mine is Gillespie, Roden from Seton Hall, Scruggs from Xavier, Champagne from St. John's and Nate Watson from Providence. You know, we didn't talk about Providence much, but man, if Nate could ever, you know, put his ass in there and get more re- like he averaged six rebounds a game last year. Man, um, that is always frustrating, at least from a DFS side, because, you know, he's so goddamn big and strong and just a grown ass man that you would you would think he would uh, be more active on the glass. Um, John, what do you got as your uh, all conference team of the Big East? I had Gillespie, Scruggs, Champagne, uh, Justin Lewis, and I, I could be sold on the. <laughs> I think Gavin just took his Justin pants off. Lewis on the all conference team. Oh, John, you're my guy. <laughs> I think it's real. I mean, that's, that's the one I'll go out on the limb on. And then uh, I'll go RJ Cole, just because I think that the raw numbers are there. And, you know, media people who vote for this stuff are going to be really, really swayed by the whole, you know, 17 points a game thing, even if it's really inefficient. Yeah. So Gavin's not going to be able to stand up for a while. But uh, Gavin, who's on your all conference team? I got. Drugs and Champagne sharing co-player of the year. I think that Gillespie makes it inevitably. And part of the reason why Gillespie doesn't make it first team is that Justin Moore actually takes the big step up with this team in terms of being, um, you know, when everybody's going to be focused on, you know, Gillespie without as much of a worry, you know, with JRE in the middle, you know, Samuels is certainly good and should be taking a big step up in a senior leadership role. I just think we, we saw Justin Moore handle the ball a lot when Gillespie was, uh, you know, hurt. And, and we saw him make pretty good strides in terms of decision making. Um, I, I really like the strides that he can make. And he's probably one of the guys that I'm highest on. I didn't want to quite name him in, the, in a you know breakout guy because he already kind of stormed onto the scene as a freshman. But I got him. And then, uh, you know, part of the reason why I'm high on, on Xavier, I got Freeman in there as well. It's obviously contingent upon uh, that big old foot of his, but. That's yeah. what I got for the five Scruggs champ, Gillespie, Fremantle, Justin Moore. Yeah. So uh, just real quick before we move on to the big 10, I think that's a good point because I've seen a bunch of 
media with Samuels in their all conference teams. I think Moore is just a better player than him overall for sure. Um, but yeah, let's, let's move on to the big 10. We got just about half an hour left. Um, so big 10, uh, the media has it like this. They got Michigan, Purdue, Illinois, Ohio state top four. I think we could probably do our own podcast on the order of those teams going into the year. Um, Maryland, Michigan state, Indiana, Rutgers, Iowa, Wisconsin, Nebraska, Northwestern, Penn state, Minnesota. Holy shit. That's a lot of teams. Um, John, we'll start with you. Who are you high on in the big 10 and why? Yeah, I was going to, hold on. I, I had my uh, low ready to go for some reason. Let me get to my high. I can start then. So the team that I'm high on is Indiana. I love Indiana coming in here. I think that the coaching change will be interesting. Uh, I think it's probably uh, overdue. Um, so I just, and they're picked around teams that I'm kind of low on, you know, they're picked around Michigan state, Iowa, and Wisconsin, who, when we go to the teams I'm low on, I have three of them and it's all three of those teams, um, for different reasons. But yeah, I just think that they have more talent than those teams. I'm a huge Xavier Johnson guy, um, for better or for worse. Uh, I just think that they were incredibly hampered by just not having a point guard last year to kind of run things. Um, you know, I don't think they lose that much. I think that he's going to mesh super well with DJD, who I think is going to be an all American this year. Um, hoping they give that, uh, the, uh, freshman Bates, uh, some playing time over fantasy, which they probably won't, but fantasy just doesn't do that much for me, but yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm higher on Indiana just from a talent perspective over those three, I guess you call them, um, incumbent powerhouses from the last couple seasons yeah um, it's going to look completely different with woodson it's it's a complete yeah. archie and all the motion stuff that he tried to do woodson is going to it, it's straight nba concepts it's wide open floor i think they're going to flourish but the team and, and this is again relative to the market but uh ruckers open 67th in ken Palm, which kind of surprised me i to me that's again uh, even if you knock them a little bit for losing Miles Johnson, which, you know, a couple points, that's fine. But to drop them to 67th when this again looks like, you know, a 9 10 seed type team, the defensive floor is really high. I mean, they're not falling below 25 in defense, worst case scenario. Uh, in the offense, again, it's contingent upon Harper coming back. He doesn't need to be a megastar, but he needs to be a lot better than he was when he went into that awful swoon in the middle of last season. But you know, if Cliff Morier steps up, as many people think he will at the five, the Johnson loss won't be bad. And they just the defense and the length and the switchability, all these buzzwords, it, it's such a dominant that they go like six, four, six, 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 seven, six, nine, six, ten. Like, and then the guys off the bench, same thing. They're just a really long team. And Pykel's a phenomenal defensive coach. Yeah, Gav, uh, what do you think about Indiana and Rutgers? Yeah, there's there was two ways to look at it. Um, well, I'll start with kind of Rutgers. Um, I mean, getting Geo Baker back, I, I think, gives you inevitably just a greater floor than a lot of the other teams. You know, if you're talking about Northwestern with Boo Booey, um, you, you know, Geo Baker controlling the offense. And frankly, I don't even know if it's worse that they lost guys like uh, Jacob Young and Montez Mathis. I, I think that getting the ball in Geo's hands, the longer, longer the better. Um, and I, I think. It, it was a little bit of too many cooks in the kitchen. I think that team sorts itself out from a, a scheme perspective a little bit better in meshes. Um, so I'm, I'm good with Rutgers uh, just from the fact that they were projected just so low. And this is generally a conference where I, I just feel like I'm, I'm lower than, than the market on a lot of these teams. Um, so I'm fine with that. Now, Indiana, I, I mean, I have Trace Jackson Davis as conference player of the year, partly due to, you know, Woodson scheme and, I think he, he gets a lot better spacing and, you know, just probably takes even another step up being a, I think he's going to his junior year. Right. But, you know, Indiana is going to be solid. We're, we're on the same page with Xavier Johnson. Uh, another guy that I think just got killed by Jeff Capel and. Yeah. Just you know, to get the hell out of pit. Yeah. Him a lot. Just, I think there's just some guys that <laughs> frankly, and I, I transferred uh, colleges in the middle of my career. I think, there's a big thing to just scene changes. 
getting a new fresh start when you just feel like things are snowballing and going downhill and, and it's hard to stop. So yeah, I'm, I'm good with Indiana, but the team that I'm high on generally speaking, and, and they're still, you know, pretty high on the market too. And, and, and that's Maryland kind of hanging around that, you know, 20 ish mark, whether you're looking on Bart Torvik or Ken Palm, they were a little bit of the flavor of the week early on in the portal um, when they grabbed Fats Russell and uh, Wahab, Kudus Wahab, C- Curtis Wahab, whatever you want to call him. Um, I think, I think Wahab completely changes the look of that team because they were so devoid of interior defensive presence. When you're rolling out an undersized, uh, Dante Scott, you're rolling out Galen Smith and you're rolling out Jairus Hamilton. You're against, not a Galen Smith guy. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> against, against, we're talking about the conference with the bar none best big men, you know, no holds bar. So yeah, I, they, they mightily struggle in that fast. I think Wahab completely changes the look of that team. I think that Fats Russell is one of these guys that comes from a mid major where he was a do it all hero and probably gets a little bit reined in, probably takes, uh, a dive in terms of usage, but takes an uptick in terms of efficiency. I think Turgeon probably keeps him in line. Um, I, I think this is a team that is as lethal, you know, to challenge with, uh, I think it, who's Purdue, you know, the top of the conference uh, as much as anybody. Yeah. I'll, I'll talk real quick on Maryland. Both my parents went there. They are pumped for this team. Uh, I agree with the Wahab addition. Um, John, we were both super high on him last year. It was awesome to see him really have a good year for Georgetown. I think Hart is the key to this team. Hakeem Hart, um, stepping in for a guy like Aaron Wiggins is, you know, a big deal. Um, I think if Wiggins comes back, this is probably a top 10, 12 team. Um, I worry a bit about two things. Fats um, going off the, you know, I have the same concerns with fats here as I do with like Remy Martin at Kansas. Exactly. Um, and then, yeah, is, is, is Hart going to take that step? You know, he kind of showed some flashes last year. Um, yeah, I, I, I can buy it. Uh, I want the Terps to be good. So, you know, I'm a little biased, but uh, what do you think about the real Terps? quick? Think about, you know, we talked about Daryl Morcel leaving because he wanted to play point guard. Well, you yeah. also got Aaron Wiggins, who is, is a mismatch issue. Doesn't matter who you put in front of him, you know, on ball. Yeah. You also got Eric Ayala, who can Ayala was awesome last and year, shoot. Man. And so that, you know, I think having fats, you know, as kind of the, what I think is going to be the relatively undoubted, you know, point guard and, and maybe Ayala com- comes in as kind of the second main combo guy. But I think, I just think that the pieces fit a lot better you know, square hole in the square peg, so to speak, for for Turgeon and what he's trying to do as well. What do you think, John? This is probably the team that I have the most milk toast opinion. Like, it's their, their range of outcomes to me is so set in stone. It's like twenty to thirty. Like, I, I have no doubt that the floor is really high and the ceiling is is very good, but not elite. Like, I would be shocked if they're outside that twenty to thirty window. And I also agree that Fats does get reined in. A little concerned about the shooting. Yeah. Uh, not a real history here. Like Dante Scott was a 42% guy, something like that last year. But other than that, they don't have like that wing sniper guy, unless Ian Martinez from Utah carves out a big piece in the rotation, maybe, but that would probably be my biggest concern. I hope, and I don't think they will. I hope they don't try and play through Wahab because that's not going to be his thing. Uh, I hope Kirchen keeps it balanced and I think he will. Yeah, so let's uh, let's let's go to the teams that we're low on. Uh, I think Gavin and I are probably on the same page. So the other two conferences, I had one team that I was definitely low on. I have three teams in the Big Ten, and I mentioned them earlier for different reasons. It's Michigan State, Iowa, and Wisconsin. I, I'm lower on all three. Um, it just seems like all these three teams are ranked based on, I don't know, like career achievement awards from their coaches and stuff, but let's take a look at the rosters, right? So Michigan state brings back the exact same team, except they lose Aaron Henry, who I think was the team was the, (laughs) yeah. I mean, um, he carried them at so many times last year through all the dysfunction Um, they're the only reason that they were even close to the tournament. Um, I think he was one of the most valuable players in the entire country. Um, it's just a group of underachieving guys that they're coming back. And I, you know, they do have the five-star in Christie who I have no doubt will be good, but 
you know, it's just the same guys who are not that good. You got Hauser coming back. You can't play a lick of defense. You've, you've still got the merry-go-round in the front court that, you know, he confirmed today that he's going to still run out the same guys. You know, he's given Marble a chance again. Uh, I think Hogar doesn't really have a place on the roster. Um, Gabe Brown is a shooter only, doesn't do anything else. It just feels like a roster of guys that you expected more from. And I feel like everyone is like, oh, yeah, they're, they're going to take that next step in their senior season. Um, so I guess let's just start with them real quick. Um, what do you think about State, John? Yeah, I mean, it's kind of the broad point we've made about the market just overpricing the Big Ten for the most part. Like they finished last year 64th in Ken Palm. Well, they're up to 22nd this year. I'm not saying they can't get the 22nd, but that has to be the very top of the range of outcomes. That's not a median. That is clearly the ceiling. And, you know, all of his, those teams going back, his best teams going back 20 years have had a really dominant point guard. Uh, you know, Cassius Winston, of course, being the most recent example. And last year with Watts and uh, God forbid, Foster Lawyer, you know, Tyson Walker, I don't know if they're just going to hand him the ball from day one and say, go be the guy. That feels like a really big ask for a mid-major point guard, granted a really good one and who had a massive usage rate at Northeastern. If that's the plan, I'd, I'd be pretty concerned with that. But I, I don't know. I agree. It's kind of the same cast of characters. If you believe the Michigan State reports and the hype, then Max Christie is the best freshman in the country. Right. That's, that's the vibe coming out of East Lansing. But from a market perspective, I, I, I'm not looking to fade them. I just I, I can't see where there's an edge there in backing them right now. Yeah. So this is this kind of goes in order of who I'm most to least confident in. So next would be Iowa. Um, I think this is the same issues that Michigan State has, except they're not bringing in a five star recruit and they don't have a point guard. <laughs> um, I think Keegan Murray is going to be really good. Uh, I'm I'm excited to see him hopefully take that next step, not foul out immediately when he gets in the game. I think he averages over four fouls per 40, uh, which is not good. Um, I think he's, so I have him on my breakout list, but out, outside of him, you've got, you know, they're bringing Bo Hannon back for his ninth year. He's going to start both of his kids, I think. Um, and then Joe Toussaint, who was terrible last year, turn the ball over like crazy. Uh, they do get the transfer from North Dakota, who I don't know that much about, but he's got to be damn good. They're 23rd at Ken Palm to start the year. I think that's a ridiculous rating, honestly. Um, you know, they're, they're higher than Florida State. They're higher than Xavier. I think Auburn, who's there, is much better. They're higher than Oregon, who I think is much better. The Bonnies. I think all those teams are much better than this. Uh, Gavin, what do you think about Iowa? Yeah, I think the way that I'm looking at it, probably the eighth eighth best team, but I, I still think it's a good drop off from kind of, you know, Michigan state to them. Um, you know, I, I'm going to be as big of a, a Keegan Murray guy as anybody. Um, and, and, you know, Joe Toussaint, yeah, he was, he was in a, in a bad spot last year. I'm a little bit more of a sympathizer for him than you are. I, I think, I think he's talking about a square hole in a, or a square peg in a round hole. I thought he, he was tough to kind of fit the system with what was around him. And he was a little bit more of an on-ball attacking threat where they just wanted to keep it moving and dump it into Garza and keep it moving outside. Um, yeah, I, I'm surprised it's only Bohannon's ninth year. I, I thought it was, he was coming on 12 or 13 at this point. Um, but yeah, there's, there's just nothing to really, you know, oodle about on this team. You know, they, they just lose. You can't overstate the loss of obviously Garza. I mean, Wieskamp was probably one of the most underrated players in the country last year. And then Frederick and Nunji, that, that's four pretty big pieces from and already what we kind of saw as susceptible team, you know, last year. Yeah. We faded them hard against Oregon. Uh, I hope you did too, John. Um, what do you think about Iowa? Yeah, I don't think I played it. This is another Ken Palm Torvik discrepancy. But for me, you know, Ken Palm is what it is. I have, you know, I use that Torvik, shot quality, hoop lens, all these different sites, but Ken Palm matters the most because it's what the market just copies. So if, if Ken Palm is 23rd and Torvik 61st, well, they're going to be priced as 23rd, at least to open the season. I thought they were going to, I kind of thought when I wrote them up in the preseason before these numbers were out, that they were going to be a little undervalued. And of course, it's just the op complete opposite. 
uh, I think every like at 23rd, the Keegan Murray breakout is not only priced in, but Keegan Murray is like the second best player in the Big Ten. If that's if they're really getting to the top 25, France, you know, his system is very conducive. The ball will move. He runs great stuff, even though he's kind of a hothead. Uh, and I kind of buy that this is a better defensive team, obviously, without Garza. But the amount of offensive talent that walked out the door is absolutely incredible. Um, everyone knows Garza, but Wieskamp was fantastic. CJ Frederick, when he was healthy, a 50% three point shooter. It's very hard to even come close to that level of production. Yeah. So we'll touch on Wisconsin real quick, and then I'll let you guys talk since I took three teams. Uh, it just. It's kind of the same thing, you know, except a worse roster, I think. Um, it's like John Davis's sophomore year, kind of, you know, different positions, but I think he'll he'll break out just like Murray will. And Davison back for his hundredth year, surrounded by a bunch of, I think, middling rotation pieces. Um, let me see where they are at uh, Ken Palm. They're at 44, so they're a little bit lower. But, yeah, I just don't see this team being that good. I, I wrote in my notes, I think Nebraska could finish above them in the Big Ten. Um, what do you think about Wisconsin, John? Yeah, this is one that if they were priced at like 80th, 70, 80, I'd say, okay, there's, there's a room to grow here because they're very young, which is unusual for a Wisconsin team. Usually, you know, one of the oldest teams in the country, but outside of uh, Davidson and Wall, it, it's a way younger team than I can ever remember there, but there's just no room at, at 44, whatever it is. That, that again, feels kind of like a best case scenario that they finish in the forties and they're at a nine seed in the tournament. That, that's it. They had to see. Yeah. And the style is just, that, that's a hard style for young players to play too. It's, it's fine for older players who can master the cuts of the swing and all that, but I'm not a fan of that with the young roster. Yeah. It seems like they're going to be relying a ton on this, freshman point guard that uh, is getting a lot of hype but uh you know we've seen that happen before uh gav what do you think about wisconsin and then do you have any other teams that you're low on in the big 10 yeah i don't know i don't have much to add to wisconsin we, we have probably need another two hours to talk about greg guard my manifesto <laughs> on how much i i dislike greg guard but <laughs> A team that I'm on, I think the way you have to look at the Big Ten is, you know, which one of these teams up top are, are you going to be fading? And for me, it came down to a conversation of Michigan and Ohio State personally. Now, I went with Ohio State. And, of course, what could go wrong in fading Leonard Hamilton and Chris Holtman? But a, a, for the same reason that I'm high on Maryland in terms of, I think, the, the scheme meshing a lot better in terms of the pieces coming in, I think it's really hard to overstate the loss of Dwayne Washington last year and what he meant to that Ohio State team, even as serviceable and, you know, as good as Liddell was. You know, you got Kyle Young. That, that front court is probably the best in the conference with suing Liddell and Kyle Young. I don't know if suing takes the step forward, partially because he's probably blocked uh, from a, a minute and usage standpoint somewhat by Liddell and Kyle Young, even though he could play kind of a, a, a tall two. They have two, uh, you know, I, I think freshman guards or one freshman guard coming in plus Jamari Wheeler. Uh, so we'll see. I, I just think, you know, Ohio State started off slow last year and, and they started surprising teams or sorry, started off hot last year and then, you know, ran into their problems, obviously, with with Oral Roberts. But, you know, what could go wrong with uh, with Faden Chris Holman? But just a team that I don't know if they really project to be kind of one of these top 10 squads that uh, a lot of these sites are, are coming out with. Yeah, I'm, I agree with you there. We said it at the top of the show. It's tough for me to see a top 10 team with Jamari Wheeler as the point guard. Um, what do you think about Ohio State? And are there any other teams that you're low on, John? Yeah, this is the roster that feels like it has the most like capable, solid guys. Like You can see 11 guys basically playing here. It's just that outside, and Liddell is the definition of like the productive, high floor, medium feeling type college player. Uh, and Kyle Young is, is the glue guy that we've grown to know over the last couple of years. But yeah, with Wheeler and then Cedric Russell from Louisiana, who was a great scorer for a couple of years, but he's like, he's like an old man pickup scorer. Like he's going to get his buckets. He's, okay, he's somewhat efficient, but to come from four years in the Sun Belt and then kind of be option two ish uh, in the big 10, I think that's a really big ask for him, but Holtman is going to get the most out of them. Like the pieces are not great individually, but they're another team with a really high floor. 
15, 20 range. So I feel totally comfortable within that area. Yeah, agreed. Um, let's, let's move on to the, the breakout and the impact guys. Uh, I think uh, the breakout guys we've already mentioned. Um, Curbelo is the obvious one, just going to step into a massive role. Um, I think even without a jump shot, he's going to contend for an all, all uh, conference and all American really status. Uh, he's going to be a monster in DFS. Gavin, I really hope we see him at like 6K to start the year and not 8K. Um, I had Curbelo and Murray uh, as, as my two breakout guys. Um, Gavin, did you have anyone else in that category? Literally had the exact same two. John? Yeah, this I, I would agree with both of those. It's hard for me to really poke holes. Somebody has to take – at Illinois, somebody has to take that kind of wing shooter scorer role – just because it's, you know, you know, Corbell is going to make a jump into the lead guard spot. You know, Trent Frazier is kind of like the off ball shooter. You have Kofi on the block. Somebody needs to kind of replace the Adam Miller role. You know, DeMonte Williams is a senior. Grandison is a senior. I think it feels like one of those guys is going to step into a much bigger role. I'm not sure which one I would. DeMonte Williams is like an efficiency monster. He's always a couple of years been one of the most efficient players in the big 10. He seems like the natural fit. So it's weird to pick a breakout guy who's that old, but all the pieces are lining up for him. Yeah, we uh, we had some interest in playing some Grandison last year when it looked like he was going to step into a larger role, and he just never yeah. really grabbed it and ran with it. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I do agree. I think Williams shot 48% or something from three. It was, it was crazy just on not that much volume. Um, the newcomers I had, uh, we talked about Xavier Johnson earlier. I think he's my number one newcomer as far as transfers slash freshmen coming in. Uh, it's just an incredible pickup. Uh, I mean, this is, this is the difference, I think, between a team like Indiana and these teams that I'm down on, you know, rolling, rolling the balls back out, or do you grab a transfer in this new I guess you could call it a new era of college basketball where that is a way that you can improve your team immediately. You know, you don't have to run out the six year senior point guard. You know, you can bring in a guy, you know, like Xavier or like what Kansas and Texas are doing. Um, and I just think it, it changes the trajectory and the ceiling of your team. Um, the other guy I had was Bryce McGowan's from Nebraska. Um probably a little higher on Nebraska. I'm not sure if they're going to defend. They're going to be awesome for daily fantasy because they're going to play fast and they're going to be able to score with this roster. Um, what do you guys think? Uh, John, do you know anything about McGowan's and uh, do you have any other newcomers? Yeah, there's going to be a weird tug and pull in Nebraska between McGowan's and Alonzo Verge, who is, of course, the ultimate chucker, green light. And he goes from Arizona. <laughs> oh, yeah. Any shot he wanted, no matter how terrible, to another system where he's going to be able to pretty much do the same thing. So the idea of having these, and I assume McGowan's, this is this could be totally wrong, but I assume McGowan's is a five-star combo guard recruit is going to want the ball a lot. That kind of feels duplicative. So that's a strange dynamic. And Hoiberg, third year roster, totally overhauled at this point. Like kind of optimistic, but it's also to see easy to see how this team like. Birds puts up 23 shots, but he's like seven for 23, you know, a lot of nights. So that's what would concern me. Uh, other breakout guys, Devontae Jones stepping oh, in. Oh, man, that was mine. <laughs> into the Mike Smith role. Kind of feels like the same thing, which isn't a bad thing. Like it's a steady, solid scoring guard who could pass. Comes from Coastal, which is you a know, better program than Columbia. Uh, you know, and he has Eli Brooks there to kind of shoulder some of the, the scoring load in the backcourt too. So Devontae Jones would be my pick. I don't think he's going to wow anybody. He's not the most explosive guy, but he's a really good fit for that system. Sorry, Gav. I put, for, I put for Jones. I put, I put, think Mike Smith, if Mike Smith was uh, bigger, stronger, uh, a little bit faster, I think, taller, more quick twitch, a better shooter, a more stout defender, and if he was actually good at basketball, that's how he compares <laughs> to Mike Smith. But he gets uh, the Smith, same role. Smith was fine. Same role, right? Um, 
All right. Well, we have to wrap up here. So let's, let's just go through our all conference team. I did a bit personally and just did five centers. Uh, I've got TJD Dickinson. We didn't talk about Michigan much, but uh, he's obviously going to be a monster. Kofi, Travion Williams, and EJ Liddell were my five. Um, Gavin, what do you got? I got Trace Jackson Davis, player of the year, Kofi, EJ Liddell, Hunter Dickinson. So I'm the same there. And then with Marcus Zagorowski leaving college basketball, I now have to have I now I now have to have a new favorite child. And I don't think there was much of a, a discussion or deliberation on this. It is undoubtedly going to be the fifth person on the first team Big Ten all conference team. And that would be one Andre Curbelo. When this Herb. game slows down for one more year for this guy. He is so electric with the basketball. He, I, like you said, he, I don't think he really needs a jump shot at the college level to, to survive. You know, we'll, it'll be another discussion at the NBA. But the kid, you, you could tell he got sped up a couple times when, you know, he, he gets the ball so deep into the lane and then somehow a lot of times finds these random just open cutters to the lane or, you know, is able to get up some kind of circus shot. I think with this guy just playing with a full year under his belt, with the game slowing down, I think capitalizes tremendously in terms of what he can do with the ball in his hands and the role he's coming into. And with everybody going, oh, yeah, there's Kofi down low. We should probably guard him. You know, yeah. I, I just think that Curbelo probably steps into a first team uh, role. And that was kind of the one I went out on a limb for. Yeah. I mean, we just saw Sharif Cooper kind of do the same thing without a jump shot over at Auburn last year. So, uh, John, what do you got for a Big Ten uh, conference? Yeah, pretty close. I would I would go Dickinson, TJD, uh, Coburn, Liddell, and then uh, I think we're all in on on the breakout here. But I, I'm really really in on it because of the tempo and because of the scheme. But Keegan Murray, I think he's he's got that modern game that fits so well in Fran's offense, and he gets as many shots as he wants this year. And he's also like this. I don't know much about the NBA, but my understanding is like he's the prototypical multi position defender, and I think that's now getting more attention than it has in the past. Yeah, I was I was a bit surprised that that he wasn't a higher recruit coming into college. Just the way that he played last year, he's so smooth. Um, yeah, he just has to stay out of foul trouble, um, which I I assume that he will improve on. Um, Talk about one thing with with Purdue. This is kind of my out on a limb take with them. I just have a hard time with. They probably have three of the like top 15, 14, 15 players in the league with Edie and Williams and Ivy. It's just a weird – you can't play them together, which really hurts. Uh, you can't play Williams and ED. They say they're going to. They say Travion's developed some skills on the perimeter. We'll see about that. Uh, yeah. Um, have you I'm seen not, these videos? This guy I'm looks not, like a, a supermodel how skinny he is I have, I have right seen. now in the offseason. Who, Trev? Yeah. Oh, man. Well, look like the same we guy. love him. What was that game in the Big Ten tournament, Gavin, where we were in Vegas That's and I was just dude. taking oh, my, my pants God. off to his second Every, half? Every – Every possession, <laughs> dumping it in down low, just bodying two to three guys on Ohio State. It was brutal. But you remember that game, John? I, part of the reason, awesome. part of the reason why I left Trevion off was, yeah, maybe he makes these strides in terms of uh, body composition changing. Maybe he develops more skills to be more perimeter oriented. Frankly, John, I don't know where you're at with Edie. I've heard good things in terms of what he's doing with Team USA. Steve and I have never been big on him. Uh, all pun intended, I guess. You know, he, he's literally just kind of a big body who just holds his arms up, and maybe the footwork develops a little bit. Yeah, he can play the interior, but I don't know what kind of offensive upside he gives you in a league where you're probably going to need to score down low when we talk about the lack of guards. So, the part of the reason I left Trevion off was just I don't know, I don't know if his role changes a whole lot with you know Matt Painter. Matt Painter's a good coach; he knows you know with Trevion how to get the most out of this guy. I don't know if all of a sudden he goes, oh yeah, you know. And, and like I said, the body composition, maybe it all changes to be more conducive to uh, conditioning. But, you know, he's one of those bigger body guys that I, I think you've got to limit, you know, some minutes towards. And so I think that kind of what keeps him off uh, first team and, and what's going to be a really competitive conference. It's yeah. The Jaden Ivy thing. Like Jaden Ivy, at least according to Twitter, is like the breakout pick everywhere. It is like the most slam dunk thing in the world. But, I mean, this is like a, a lottery pick type scoring guard, and he's in Matt Painter's like half court motion offense. With I know. Yep. I mean, it's so weird. It doesn't yeah. totally work. So the big thing for me, and I and I do like Purdue, um, 
it feels like everyone is just going to assume that the ED Travion thing is going to work out perfectly. And I'm not sure if there is an answer there, you know, I'm not sure if they can play together and every minute that you have ED on the court, you don't have Travion Williams on the court. One of the best players in the country. Uh, I think, you know, it's, I think it's going to take them some time to figure that out. Um, Edie's obviously good, but man, it is tough. And like John said, past the top three, I'm not sure of their depth. Um, I'm not sure if they have impact role players like the other top teams in the Big Ten do. You know, if you look at like in Illinois, you know, you got Frazier, you got Grandison. These are old ass dudes who have been there. Um, but yeah, I'm I'm glad that you brought Purdue up because it would be tough to uh, do an entire Big Ten uh, <laughs> preview without <laughs> talking about them. You know, we we tried to do this a little differently than any than in, um, other pods who were just going to talk about like the top two three teams of each uh, conference. I, I hope y'all enjoyed. Um, we'll we'll be back next Wednesday. Um, Gavin and I will be back. Uh, we'll try to convince John to come on. I know that we went long here, so probably not but uh, <laughs> uh he's an attorney he works by the hour so you better uh, shake the couch cushions yeah, yeah so you know he can just uh he can just bill run pure but um it was great having you john um gav we will talk soon and uh we will see you guys next wednesday